So the level of conflict is high, but ma'am, I find that the, the conflict itself really originates with you. I will do my best to keep it brief, Your Honor. We're here because Ms. Farrar is unable to put her own petty differences above and do, what, and do what's best for Army. And her inability to do that has resulted in Army having to have five crowns, have two teeth extracted, and potential permanent damage to, to his teeth. The standard before Your Honor is what is in Army's best interest to modify custody under True X. Looking at NRS 125-480-4, subsection D, the level of conflict between the parents is very high. These people can't even communicate. She requires that a designee exist because she refuses to communicate with him. He has no issue communicating with her. That, that's on her. She re, she's the one who there is court orders in place because of her inability to communicate. The ability of the parents to cooperate and meet the needs of the child. I think the testimony is evident of that today. They can't do it. Dr. Valina has never even met Ms. Farrar. He tries to email, he extends the olive branch, and now it's used against him. He only truly wants what's best for Army. She wants to fight. The physical, developmental, and emotional needs of the child, subsection 4G, that's really where the heart of this lies. Army's teeth are falling out and rotting, literally, because of her refusal to brush his teeth. You saw the evidence of the red coat tests that are by judicial notice occurring on the Wednesdays after her undisputed custodial time. Both the doctor, the doctor testified that it has to be at least 24 hours or more of plaque. You saw Mr. Falcone step up to the plate and make these appointments and get this done and be there for Army because he was so concerned he saw his son in pain. Mom sending an email saying he's not in pain, he's fine. I don't agree to the surgery. Because I don't think it's medically necessary. She never called the doctor to find out that it needed to happen right away, that it was an emergency, that he's in pain, that he's hurting. She didn't take the time to do that. She didn't even show up. Part of the physical, developmental, and emotional needs of, of Army is his schooling. The absence is it's not the first time we've had this issue before the court. And it's getting worse. 13 absences last year. She doesn't even know what the Washer County limit is. I don't know what it is either, but I don't have kids. So I don't need to know. But if you're on the verge of hitting those absences, you should know what they are. And there's no concern or cause whatsoever. Take him out of school. It doesn't matter if it's excused or not. He's not there. He's not getting the instruction. That's a concern. And this court has acknowledged that concern before. Even the, the petty things such as the t-shirt. It's embarrassing for Army to be at school and have a shirt that's too small and he gets made fun of. It's embarrassing for Army to have metal in his teeth and his friends are looking at him weird going, what's going on? Not to mention he was in pain before that. And she wasn't honest about it and the evidence under, showed that via the emails with the teachers that Mr. Falcone is having to come up with convoluted ways to protect his own son because of her refusal to communicate. Not once did she email him and say, hey, what's going on with the shirts? It doesn't exist. So under the level of conflict between the parents, the abilities of the parents to cooperate and meet the needs of the child, the physical development and emotional needs of the child, those all weigh heavily in Mr. Falcone's favor. You also have heard evidence, Your Honor, of parental abuse. Um, I understand corporal punishment. There was a recent article in the writ, though, that courts are cracking down. I think it's just in the writ that came out yesterday citing some California cases about looking at the standards the, of abuse, what the weapon that was used, not the weapon, I shouldn't say weapon, the tool that was used, where the child was hit and the extent of the in injury is what the two recent California cases um, discuss. She didn't hit him once, she didn't hit him twice, she hit him seven times. Seven times on the hand. I don't want to get hit seven times on the hand, that would hurt. I'm sure Army was not very happy about it and probably very scared. I understand that as a parent, children can frustrate you. Sometimes 
you don't react perfect. And I'm not sitting here saying that she should not have joint custody because she's not a perfect mom. But one, two versus seven, there is a difference. So that's another factor. The neglect, I mean, that also goes to the dentist. The dentist issue, the doctor testified that it constitutes neglect. Arguably, it also could constitute an act of domestic violence, which is subsection K. It's a battery under the definition of domestic violence, which is NRS 33081. So on that basis alone is our position that it is in Army's best interest that Mr. Falcone receive primary physical custody. Our concern is, is that she will continue to mask the issues as she's done with the absences and now calling him excused. She'll brush her teeth right before the exchange. The doctor said it's really hard to tell and it'll be too late before we get where the decay is so bad up in the gums to where we, to fix it will be another surgery. That's our concern. You heard evidence from the notes through Leah that Mr. Falcone is going, I don't want to do this. I don't know what else to do, do though to help my son. Mr. Falcone has also requested that he be permitted to move to Las Vegas. Under Schwartz, he's demonstrated an actual, a good faith basis for that request, which the law is you have to show an actual advantage, what they, which they say is by showing a good faith basis. He's shown his intentions are true. Going to law school is a, is a, a genuine motive, especially considering um, obviously an extensive interest that he's shown even in, um, in, the, in the law. Um, and participating in many different various um, Supreme Court appeals. He'll follow any order this court makes. With regards to visitation, he testified, I'm not here to keep you from your, from your son. Skype, telephone, as much as you want to see him. Let's just brush his teeth. Let's make sure he's healthy. Let's make sure that he is well taken care of. So those are the precautions that need to be put in place. The move away is allowed. And I don't begrudge her for opposing it. I think that that's a genuine reason. And that's one of the factors for the court to consider under Schwartz. But ultimately, it comes down to what's in Army's best interest. It's a, an eight-year-old boy who's already having to have major dental surgery because mom couldn't put her differences aside. She's demonstrated by even these midnight exchanges. She's doing what is best for her, not what's best for Army. So the very minimum, we ask that those midnight exchanges go away. But we think that in every other weekend custody situation, if your owner is inclined to deny the move away at this time, um, but we do request a, a right for him to move away next summer um, with the primary physical custody schedule in place until then, and then um, to work out the schedule thereafter. We also ask for a judgment in the amount of $1,663.48 with penalties and interest for the unpaid medical arrears. I also ask for a judgment in the amount of $876, which is 12 months of unpaid child support, as she has not paid since October of 2013. That's at the $73 a month rate. She did pay in October? She paid in September. She did not pay in October. Then we're at 13 months. Oh, wow. It is November, isn't it? Thank you, Your Honor. So that, that's another 73. Thank you. I'm going to give you the final word, ma'am. sure what to say except I don't think it would be our an army's best interest to move him to a different city and I don't think it would be an army's best interest for me to see him two weekends out of a month um, and I don't think he can prove that I'm not brushing his teeth because I am and uh, the doctor said that he can't prove that it's not him. And I would hate to accuse anybody of purposely doing something like that. But we've been in court for a very, very, very long time. And he is not admitted to law school. He doesn't have a job offer. He wants permission to move to Las Vegas based on what he wants to do, not what he's actually capable of doing. And in order to be close to my son, I would have to move there, and then I wouldn't, if he doesn't have a job, and if he can't take care of Army and support him, 
I would have given up my ability to take care of him. And granted, I can get another job. It might not be a great job right away, and it might not be as well-paid a job, but I can get another job or a couple of jobs. Um, but it would seriously cripple us, and he can't prove that he's going to get a job. He hasn't been able to hold one regularly Army's entire life. He can't prove that he's going to be able to take care of him down there. I'm sorry, I can't see anything else. All right, thank you. Based on the papers and pleadings on file herein, uh, the previous orders that have been entered uh, by this court, and based upon the testimony and the documents that have been admitted in evidence here today, the court makes the following findings and conclusions of law. The court finds that it has jurisdiction over the parties and over the party's minor child, that Nevada continues to be the home state and habitual residence for purposes of the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Enforcement Act, the Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act, and also for purposes of the Hague Treaty with regard to the minor child. Uh, going through the factors, and those factors, ma'am, are set out at NRS 125.480, as Ms. Aiden uh, noted. I actually had noted exactly the same factors that Ms. Aiden highlighted in her closing argument. The first thing I'm going to say is if the standard is that a parent has to be perfect, there's not a single one of us who is entitled to be parents and all children should be given over to the state. Um, we don't have to be perfect. But what we have to do is be able to put our, chil our children's needs in front of our own. And ma'am, that I've not seen from you. When I look at factor D under N NRS 125.480 subpart 4, the level of conflict between the parties. That level of conflict is very high, but it is also in some ways one-sided. Um, Ms. Aiden is correct. You require the designee. You weren't even notifying Mr. Falcone of medical visits until ordered to do so. The testimony of Ms. Falcone and Mr. Falcone was consistent in that they both indicate they placate you. They don't put things that are confrontational in emails because it's not helpful. They don't confront you in public because it's not helpful. The confrontations, ma'am, are coming from your side. And you're the one who insists on having witnesses with you at everything. You're the one who insists that there is some ulterior motive. When Ms. Falcone testified that she didn't need to go in to be with you and Mr. Falcone at the dentist appointment, that to me showed remarkable maturity. She recognized and she said it. She said he had a mother and a father. They were both there. They didn't need me in the room. That from a step parent is remarkable insight and the type of insight I don't usually see. This was a step parent who absolutely knows what her role is, yet is willing to step up and still be a source of comfort and support to your child. That's somebody I would want on my side, not somebody I would be trying to alienate, because she gets it. Um, so the level of conflict is high, but ma'am, I find that the, the conflict itself really originates with you. The ability of the parents to cooperate, that ability is virtually non-existent. And part of that, ma'am, uh, I found to be very troubling. Your statement at one point, let him handle the dental. And it was said with tone. That wasn't a, let's, let's deal with different um, portions of our child's health care. This was, let's, let's put a burden on him. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that your child needed that health care. It was more, 
let's stick a thorn in dad's side and let's do it this way. Had, you did not, during the entire time that your child had a significant need with regard to his dentistry, you didn't acknowledge it or recognize it. You say now you were glad that it happened. But at the time that your child's in pain, that the dentist is saying this needs to happen now, the testimony from the expert today was that there was such significant um, progression of the dental decay from the uh, x-rays taken in June to the x-rays taken in July that she was alarmed and, and needed to have the surgery done as soon as possible. Your recalcitrance and your statement, well, we can just wait until January. No, you couldn't. And the fact that you, especially someone in the medical field, I mean, you work around this. How you could not acknowledge that is beyond me. Number one, how you could not know that your child's in pain, how you could let this type of dental decay progress to the point that it was at, and then when you find out what the progression is, that you then say, we aren't going to jump on this and do something immediately. That to me is incomprehensible. Mr. Falcone testified that he put, he put this, the surgery on credit cards and he took out a loan to make it happen. You were just worried about the, the insurance. And it is your job, ma'am, when, well, the insurance told me that it wasn't medically necessary. It's your job to be your child's advocate. Talk to the doctor. Have the doctor intercede with insurance. There are ways for doctors to demonstrate to the insurance that in this case it is a medical necessity. There was no testimony that you had gone through that exercise at all. Instead, you were just worried about the cost, at the cost of your child. And you know this. The expert said what the consequences would be. There are consequences to your child's permanent teeth. There are consequences to the nerves. There are consequences to his entire system. Because once that infection either goes to the permanent teeth or to the jawbone, it becomes systemic. The doctor talked about that. That's that's a problem for a child health-wise. It's also a problem for a child socially. For him to have that type of, of dental care and to try and hang out with his friends, I don't know how that happens. You also demonstrated a remarkable lack of sensitivity in sending your child to school in shirts that were too small for him. His dad figured out how to, how to deal with that and how to make it so that he could limit the embarrassment to his child as much as possible, but you couldn't even cooperate to the extent that you could get shirts back and forth to one another so that your child could go to school in, in clothing that fit him. And the shock that was registered when asked, did you know about this? The shock that was registered by Mr. Falcone, I believe to be genuine. He said, this is the first time I've ever heard anything about shirts, and he was absolutely dumbfounded. I believe that shock to be real. I don't think that was, some, I don't believe that he was acting, I believe that that was real. Which means your lack of ability to cooperate has even extended to the point that you can't even reach out and say, look, you've got all of his, his uniform shirts, I need some of those back. When we look at school, and frankly, I am disappointed at both of you. Uh, if schooling is such an issue, I would know right off the top of my head what the requirements are for your child to be able to move on to a different grade. It's not unexcused absences. It's absences, period. I just want to take this opportunity to disagree with the judge. I think that most of even my YouTube audience would not know what the specific details are on the school's absence policy. And the reason why is because most of us as parents aren't trying to even get anywhere near an imaginary threshold. When we think of our children not going to school, we think of them not going to school once or twice. So we're not, uh, it, I mean, most parents probably 
90% of parents don't go and check these things because they just assume that their child is going to miss like one or two days of school, maybe three at most. And so they just assume that that number is not anywhere near whatever number the school has come up with policy. So the people that need to look it up might be the ones that are extraordinarily curious or maybe somebody who's going to do something extraordinary with their child like go out of the country for a couple of weeks or take their child to like a medical surgery or something like that but for the rest of us we're thinking our child's going to go to school every day they might miss one or two days there's no need to check for a policy if your child's going to miss a day or two at school nobody's going to think to themselves the school has a one absence limit so this i don't know why she's making this statement but this is also possibly one of those things that i've discussed in a previous video what i call canned statements that the courts will make um, that aren't true, but it's a way for the court to kind of blast both sides of the case. I feel like they go to some kind of training class where they're told that they need to blast both sides of the case at least once for some reason. Like, I, I don't know what the reason is, but I'm sure that it's something psychological. This isn't something that you'll see from non-family division judges. It's just something specific to the family division. So I have a feeling it's embedded in their training somewhere. I wish I could remember the name. The, um, I think it might be the video getting explanations where I discuss these canned statements. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and move on. And ma'am, the fact that you have been warned and you know that absences are a problem and you're still pulling your child out of school for uh, things other than illness, that, that also is inexplicable to me. This is a child who struggles in school by your own testimony, who has difficulty, who has a tutor. Who the, the tutor important, um, employment or excuse me appointment was to you more important than getting him to his pre-op appointment so that he could have his teeth done. So clearly schooling should be something that the, that is at the forefront and at times you will let it be, but then you pull him out of school for no apparent reason. I mean, his schooling when he has vacations and under the Washoe County school calendar, he's got a lot of them, um, to pull him out when there's active instruction going on is inappropriate and just shows, ma'am, especially after the warning you got from Judge Weller, shows that you are tone deaf when it comes to these things. You're going to do what you want to do regardless of the impact to your child. So. Once again, with regard to that factor, uh, first of all, you're unable to cooperate. But secondly, ma'am, you are not meeting the physical, developmental, and emotional needs of your child, which is another factor I need to look at. The midnight exchanges highlight that to me as much as your, your lack of attention to his teeth. This is an eight-year-old, and it is perfectly acceptable to you that because you're getting off work, even though it's the middle of the night and this child is asleep in bed, it is perfectly acceptable to you that he be rousted out of bed and then be forced to walk between his father and you. His dad can't even put him in your car. He's got to walk to you because this satisfies something for you. And what does he do when he gets back to your house? You put him back in bed. There, there is no earthly purpose that is served by having your child rousted out of bed at midnight, except yours. Doesn't You are not looking at the best interest of your child. That is all about you. And there is no good reason for that at all, save and accept a statement you made at the very end, which was, this was 50-50. Um, that is somebody who's putting their interests far be for their children when it comes down to something like that. If you can't give up the additional eight hours it would take for this child to be able to finish his night in his own bed and then get up in the morning and come see you, again, that, that is something that highlights, puts a big red marker around your inability to put your child first above your own needs. Uh, the final issue is the evidence of neglect. I don't think it's evidence of abuse. I think it's evidence of neglect. And the, he, he is very close to educational neglect. And at this point, he is certainly at dental neglect. Now, you asked the doctor, the dentist, 
why she didn't report as a mandatory reporter. And the only reason she didn't is because your child's father at this point had undertaken to make sure that he got the surgery that he needed. Otherwise, uh, the indication I had was she would have reported. Had this remained unchecked, had there not been an immediate surgery planned, had we waited until January, I believe there would have been a CPS report, ma'am, and I think it would have been well-founded. So there is evidence of neglect, and I believe it to be evidence of neglect on your part. Uh, you indicated that you yourself have dental difficulties. You, indi you, you did not refute the testimony that was offered up about your own dental hygiene. And I've got the pictures that were testified to by a dental expert that when those pictures were taken, this child had not had oral hygiene for at least 24 hours. That was on your watch, ma'am. There is proof that the lack of brushing is on your watch. Now the testimony was that Mr. Falcone and his wife brush his teeth themselves at night to make sure that everything's taken care of. And they give him the opportunity to try and brush his teeth in the morning so that he can learn how to do it for himself. That is both taking care of the problem and empowering your child to learn how to take care of himself. That's parenting. The pictures that I saw with the red coat tests in Exhibit I demonstrate that uh, that parenting is not taking place on your watch to your child's great detriment. Given those factors, all of which weigh heavily in favor of primary physical custody to Mr. Falcone, I am going to grant that motion. Uh, I am going to order that visitation take place now every other weekend on your days off, ma'am, which means you will have your child starting Sunday morning at 8 a.m. We aren't doing any more of this midnight stuff. That's cruel. And it's pointless. That, is, as I indicated before, it's one of the more ridiculous things I've ever heard of. And your child deserves to have an unbroken night of sleep. You will take, you will have your child from Sunday at 8 a.m. and you will return him to school on Tuesday mornings. That's your time with your child. You will have the ability to have one phone call a day. I would request that that phone call not take place right before your child goes to sleep. Um, I think sometime after dinner, before he does his homework, um, or as he's doing his homework, is a better way to deal with that. And sir, you are going to accommodate that phone call. Absolutely. Um, if I find out that you haven't, you there can put will me be in problems. jail. Those will happen. Um, now, with regard to the move, NRS 125C.200 actually deals with moves when the child is being taken out of state, not moves that are in state. <coughs> but Mr. Falcone has made that motion because a move from Reno to Las Vegas is significant. And I think he started with a move that was going to be out of state. I am going to make some findings, but I'm going to have some requirements sir, that go along with it. Okay. I find that there is a good faith reason for the move, um, and I'm pointing to the Schwartz factors, ma'am. There is a good faith reason for the move. Um, Mr. Falcone has indicated that he wishes to further his education. He wants to go to law school. There is not a law school that he can attend here in Reno. He would have to do it either at the Boyd School of Law or some other accredited school outside of the state. For your purposes, Boyd is probably the best choice because there's easy transportation between here and Las Vegas. Um, once he has satisfied that good faith reason to move, I then look at the other factors. Will this improve the quality of life for Mr. Falcone and, his, um, and your child? And um, there has been testimony that there is a support network that is there for him with extended family, that um, he believes 
that he will have a greater ability to become employed, that there are educational advantages for him in Las Vegas that don't exist here, um, that those advantages will, not immediately, but will lead to um, an improvement in his employment and income. And I also believe that there are needs for this child that will be met whether he is here in Reno or whether he is in Las Vegas when he lives with his father. And, one of, and some of those needs include his dental care and his educational care. He needs somebody who's going to get him to school and who's going to brush his teeth. And I, I think it is fortunate that that type of neglect has not manifested itself in other ways. I believe that Mr. Falcone's stated motives are honorable. I don't believe they're de designated just or designed just to frustrate your ability to see your child. Um, so I make that finding. I find that Mr. Falcone will comply with the any type of visitation orders that are put in place by this court. The fact that we have such a rich amount of um, pleadings and documents that have been filed in this case demonstrate to me that Mr. Falcone will come to the court and ask for permission to do things rather than just proceed on his own. I, I believe, ma'am, that your resistance to the move is honorable. I don't think you're undertaking that for a bad motive. You aren't doing it just to be me. Um, and I also believe that a realistic opportunity for substitute visitation is available. I am not going to finally grant the move, however, Mr. Falcone, until you can demonstrate to this, this court that you either have a job in Las Vegas or that you've been admitted to law school. Okay. And preferably, I would come back with both of those things satisfied. I'll come back with both. Um, because we need, we need to have an ability to support that child. It's really insightful that she entered that with an or clause instead of an and clause. Um, if she had not done that, I would have had to come back to court and try to motion to relocate again when I decided not to go to law school. Um, my choice to just take full advantage of my engineering degree was absolutely the best choice I could have possibly made. I've had unending employment for five, six, seven years now, and my income is six figures beyond so the decision to stay with software engineering was far and away the best possible decision that could that i could have made with regards to um, an improvement in income quality of life etc when when you demonstrate those things to the court i also want a specific visitation plan in place and uh, how that plan is going to be dealt with Okay. and how it's going to be paid for. Okay. Ma'am, the idea that your child support is going to be abated, that, that is a real payment. You may not think so because right now you're not paying child support, but you are obligated to do so. And to abate child support so that you can aggregate the amount to be able to uh, pay for some of the visitation is appropriate. However, it's not appropriate to put the full burden on Ms. Farrar for the visitation costs. Sir, you're the one moving away. In that circumstance, generally the court looks to you to assist with those costs. So I am going to order that going forward you're going to pay for one half of the transportation costs okay. for visitation. Okay. So this order here is one of the judge's mistakes. She hasn't looked into the history of the case or, that, or asked for input. It would have been much smarter for her to find a way to make the abatements cover the whole amount rather than just half. What she ends up doing is making me pay for half and have the abatements pay for half, which is going to lead to motions. This will lead to the filing of motions which because my ex is going to exploit it. The, 
the thing that this judge doesn't understand is that she's dealing with a, a parent with mental health issues who is not capable of avoiding conflict. As soon as this judge resolves these issues on this day, my ex just resorts to finding other conflicts to create in other areas, and this is one of them. You will get to see this discussed at a hearing, and you will see the judge get pissed off at my ex. This is not the only mistake that this judge makes, though. She also makes another mistake with regards to the exchange of clothing, which is going to trigger multiple filings of contempt and another hearing. And then there are, I mean, there's this judge is going to make a series of unfortunate mistakes that ultimately contributes to my ex losing legal custody. So again, I said this in the path, uh, in the past with Judge Chuck Weller. Had the judge made the correct decisions all the way through, it is very likely that my ex would still have some form of custody to the state. But the mistakes that the judges make end up invariably leading my ex to I guess they call it, they give her enough rope to hang herself. So both the mistakes of Judge Chuck Weller and the mistakes of Judge Bridget Robb lead, I mean, it's not really fair to them because they're just trying to be fair to her. But in the same sense, they're not paying attention to her conduct in, in, in enough detail that they can foresee what she's going to do. So these mistakes lead her to abusing the privileges that she's given which causes more conflict and more damage to our son which leads to the, the deprivation of the remainder of, of her uh, child custody rights ultimately someday in the future i'm hoping that these judges get some extensive training on high, high conflict child custody and un what they really need to understand is that these parents are addicted to conflict in the way that a drug addict might be addicted to heroin or crystal meth or alcohol um, for an alcoholic. And if they can sort of make this connection that this is a person who is not addicted to substances, but instead they're addicted to conflict, they should be able to hopefully draw the analogy from one to the other and take the appropriate steps to protect the child. But under these circumstances, back then in 2014, this is the best that this judge could do for me at the time. And of course, we will continue to cover the case as it goes forward. So you'll get to see the series of hearings that comes up following this judge's ruling and all of that. That will be covered in the My Docket series. Now, with regard to the requested judgment, I am ordering the judgment. The, um, the amount of $1,663.48 is ordered as being one half of the outstanding after application of um, uh, the insurance. That's one half of what's outstanding for uh, the minor child's dental surgery, including the anesthesia. And it sounds to me like this poor child needed anesthesia. That will uh, accrue interest at the legal rate from the date that the billing occurred or the date that it was paid by Mr. Farrar. Ma'am, you are going to pay that. There are outstanding 13 months of child support at the amount of, what is it, 70, let's see, $73.91. And that's after the application of a downward deviation for one half of the medical insurance. That amount is $960.83. That will accrue uh, legal penalties and interest at the legal rate. So both of those things. Um, and both of those are appropriate given the fact that there was already a child support amount established. Ma'am, you had the opportunity to come to court to ask that that child support obligation be uh, altered in some way based upon the amount of the uh, based upon the amount of the insurance based upon the disparity in income based upon many things and in fact you knew that that could happen because Mr. Farrar had attempted it and you quoted that order to me so you know that that is in your legal remedy toolbox but you didn't use it and I am not going to go back and abate in fact I cannot go back and abate an adjudicated child support amount that has accrued. It is vested now. You owe it. And you will continue to owe it unless you take steps to do something about that. I am going to order that both of those judgments be paid off by making a payment of at least $50 a month. And, ma'am, you will make the ongoing child support payment of $73.91.
So I strongly suspect that this payment plan the judge is ordering is an abuse of her discretion. Um, well, only if it forecloses or forbids the right to execute on the judgment. There is no authority in Nevada law that allows a judge to impose a payment plan on judgments. Other states do allow you to do this. I think like Rhode Island is one of them. It jumps to mind because I used to work in collections. But in Nevada, execution is controlled by the judgment creditor and the amount of money that is taken out of a check is based upon the loss, the statutes. So I have a very strong suspicion that this is appealable. I have, I could have sworn that I have seen this issue appealed successfully in ordinary lawsuits, but I don't know if I've ever seen a case go up on appeal in the Supreme Court, specifically with regards to child support. In any event, it does not sound to me like it's legal because theoretically, you could end up with a judgment of $100,000 and a judge can order a payment plan for $100 a month just deciding that that's what the other person could afford to pay, which would be very frustrating to a person who brought a lawsuit because they were probably planning strategically to execute on certain assets. So this judge, might mean well, and she may have in invented her own personal opinion as to what the law should be on this, but just because that's what she feels the law should be doesn't mean that's what the law actually is. So I am not 100% sure because I didn't need to file an appeal on this issue. My ex didn't even pay that amount. She didn't pay anything. And so I immediately went into execution and asset seizure. At that point in time, this judge does intervene and punish me for doing so, at which point I file an appeal and the Supreme Court of Nevada overturns her decision not once but twice. So this is the first um, of the mistakes that this judge is going to make that's actually going to affect her error rate on appeal. In any event, we'll wait and talk about these issues when they actually come up in the My Docket series, but I wanted to let you know that I have serious doubts that what this judge did with imposing the payment plan was consistent with the law. Sir, you have the opportunity to have the DA's office do a wage assignment, and I'm going to order that a wage assignment uh, be put in place. This is more than 30 days worth of arrears that we are talking about here. It's 13 months. It's time for uh, garnishment to be put in place so that these uh, child support payments can be paid. Um, what we are going to do is I want updated financial disclosures, sir, from you and from you, ma'am, that includes the updated insurance amount. Because now that Mr. Uh, Falcone has primary fiscal custody, we are offsetting anymore. Your child support obligation is going to change. That's why I'm asking for the updated information. One of the things I will look at is relative income of the parties. Sir, if your um, spouse is contributing to the household income, I need to know by how much. I'll report every penny. All right. Time frame of when you'd like those filed, Your Honor. Uh, let's have those filed within 10 days, please, Great. and submitted, and the court will adjust child support accordingly. The court's order with regard to uh, the, the visitation with the child uh, will start next week. So the very first day that Mr. Ferrar will have primary physical custody will be Tuesday after school. That way, ma'am, you can have time with your child um, and you will have your regular visitation with the exception that we are going to an immediate 8 a.m. Uh, exchange. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. On the financial information, are you going to give me a list of the forms you want me to fill out? It's the, the financial disclosure form, ma'am, and I want three pay stubs to be attached to that. Okay. If you go to the self-help center, they have that form for you. You can actually download it. Um, okay. It's on the court website as well. I'm sorry. I've never done this without a lawyer before. Um, so starting this weekend at 8 in the morning. Starting Sunday, your your exchange from on, on Sunday it will be at 8 o'clock. Okay, and then you, will you, I be getting him every weekend? No, every other. But this is the first weekend that you'll have him. Judge, just for clarification, they had exercised prior the holiday time yesterday, which then started today, as the stepmother has picked Army up from school. 
um, he's willing to offer to her regular custodial time would be through Wednesday morning with him picking up Wednesday after school if she they wanted to do an exchange tonight to pick up army let's go um, ahead and do that that way ma'am you'll have that time with your son um, I... right but following the regular schedule then he'd have Wednesday Thursday right Friday exchanging right. Sunday at 8 a.m. right and well we, we just wanted to offer her tonight the thing is if I pick my son up tonight I mean, I would love to see him, but it wouldn't be in his best interest. All right. I do. Well, the offer was there. I um, appreciate and it. I, I appreciate the sensitivity from your end, ma'am. I Thank would just you. see him for a couple hours before he went to sleep and then take him to school in the morning. And All right. So 8 a.m. on Sunday. Okay. Ms. Aiden, if you will prepare the order for the court. Absolutely, Your Honor. Uh, ma'am, you will have a draft of this order sent to you. You have an opportunity to review it, make sure that it says what I have said here today. I will let you know that my staff also reviews these orders to make sure that they comply with what is, has been ordered today as well. So it goes through a double check, yours and mine. If you have objections to the order, you have the opportunity to file those objections with the court. This matters in recess. All right. guys we have a few ancillary documents to go through before I wrap up this video I'm gonna go through them as quickly as possible we start off with the minutes the minutes are typically entered a couple of days after a hearing um, as my standard policy in the proper person channel or more specifically the my docket series goes I like to spend much more time on the final written order, not the minutes, because the final written order is what controls when you try to hold your ex in contempt. The final written order is what controls on appeal. The minutes are just kind of a placeholder, in my opinion, some notes that a clerk took, and they don't always um, control, I don't think they control, in Nevada, I don't think they control anything at all, not even, uh, I don't even think you can contempt somebody with the minutes. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is we actually have specific case law that forbids using these on appeal. So, and the other thing I should mention, one more thing is oftentimes it's duplicative because the final written order is usually a verbatim copy, um, only much more concise and with citations of law and fact. So I'm going to go ahead and just glaze over this. It looks like they notate the uh, dentist's testimony. They notate my wife's testimony. They notate my ex's testimony. And they just go through, <clears throat> it looks like just several notes that were taken by the clerk. And then they go through the court's order, which is going to reflect what you all just saw just now in um, the final portion of that video, that hearing video. So nothing else to go through with the minutes. Let's take a look at the exhibits. This is just an index. This is not the actual exhibits that were submitted. Um, I will tell you guys that I am 99% sure that each and every single one of these exhibits was attached to a motion or an opposition or a reply or something. I highly doubt any of these exhibits were not covered in the My Docket series already anyway so even if we did have the actual exhibits attached to this document i'm sure it would just be something that we already ended up going over in the my docket series um remitter this is the remitter from the supreme court on the recent appeal i believe this is the appeal on child support that was dismissed and it's just the court the lower court receiving uh, um, basically approval from the Supreme Court of Nevada that they have once again regained their jurisdiction over these issues, this case, and they can now, um, you know, continue to resolve any issues that come up with regards to child support. Clerk's certificate. This is the Supreme Court of Nevada's certificate of that remitter and the judgment of the Supreme Court. Notice of change of address. I am letting the lower court know that my email addresses, I guess those have changed? Yeah, my email address has changed and also, oh no, my physical address remains the same. So I don't, I don't think I needed to file this. In fact, I have an attorney that's substituted in, so I definitely didn't need to file this. I don't think 
we need to keep the court up to date on our email addresses. If I needed to keep anyone up to date, it would have been just my ex and her attorney if she has one. At this point, I don't think she has one, but she will get one soon, a new one. Um, so I could have probably just sent this email directly to my ex, maybe through Our Family Wizard to let her know. I don't think this needed to be filed with the court. In fact, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't have filed it. Or I wouldn't have directed my attorney to file it. Uh, next page is a Rule 5 Certificate of Service indicating this document was mailed to my ex. Here we have a substitution of counsel. A lot of people might ask, why did you substitute your counsel after she did such an amazing job for you at the hearing? You brought five issues to the court. You won on all five. You basically, like, people want to know why I did this. I couldn't afford that attorney. It's that simple. I appreciate her for winning, but I can't afford her. I don't want to string her along. I don't want to end up owing her tens of thousands of dollars and pay her back 10 years from now. That's not right. That's not fair to her. So I cut her loose because I could not afford her. That's It was that simple. Even after you win a hearing, you may end up finding yourself forced to do this just because of money issues, which is very, very common with my viewers. We are not rich people on this channel. Or at least at the time, I, I know some people would argue with that now based on my change of income from having graduated and all that. But at the time that I went through this, I couldn't afford this attorney. Monica Cavarotti has already represented me at one point in this hearing. She is a friend of mine then. She is a friend of mine now. She represented me for free. And so to substitute this attorney out for this attorney, I think, was the only choice that I really had. So Monica Cavarotti will be taking over for me. One of the things you guys will notice with this um, document, the substitution of counsel, is that you don't need approval from a judge. When you file a substitution of counsel, you automatically transfer your case from one attorney to the next without court approval, which is one of the very nice things about using this mechanism for swapping out attorneys. I think I talk about this in the video, removing an attorney. Definitely take a look at that if you guys want to learn all the different ways in which you can do that. Um, Rule 5 Certificate of Service indicating that this document was mailed to my ex. General Financial Disclosure Form. This is the one that was entered by me. This document is just like all of the other financial disclosure forms. Um, it's just money. It's barely a legal document. It lets the court know how much money you have, what your occupation is, your degree of education, whether you're employed, whether you're not employed, how much you've paid your attorney, all of these details. Um, I'm going to continue to scroll down. Um, it just goes through my paychecks, my salary. Um, I don't see anything else here that jumps out at me is something I should talk about. As of all of my videos in the My Docket series, guys, you can go down into the description below, click on the link, download the document for yourself, take a look, and if there is anything in there that you have a question about, do not hesitate to post that question down in the comments, and I'll answer it to the best of my ability. But when it comes to non-legal documents, I tend to kind of glaze over them because for the most part, they're self-explanatory. You can see that I've listed my child's expenses, I've listed my expenses, I've listed my household information. If you've ever done your taxes on your own through TurboTax, if you've ever filled out a job application or a bank loan, anything like that, this is typically the kinds of the kind of information that you put into a a financial disclosure form like you can see the the assets my car um that i owned this is my wife's car here under number two uh, looks like we have the affirmation which is going to state that the um, this document does not contain the social security number of any person and um, a rule 5 certificate of service indicating that i mailed this financial disclosure form to my ex here we have my ex's financial disclosure form. I am not going to scroll through this document. I will go ahead and upload this to YouTube down in the description below. If you want to, you can click and download it, take a look for yourself. Of course, the sensitive information is going to be redacted but at least it'll give you an opportunity to take a look at any non-sensitive information, if there even really is much of anything in there. Um, I might just black out the dollar amounts and leave uh, maybe the specific listing of, for example, the costs and expenses, so you can see what kind of costs and expenses she's claiming, but I'm gonna leave the dollar amounts out. I feel like that's sensitive information. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and move into the next document. Here we have a request for submission. Usually when we see these, I pretty much say something along the lines of, hey guys, I've seen like 50 of these, we've gone over 50 of these, and so I'm gonna just direct you to the video on the topic, request for submission, yada, 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 and I close out the video. But there is drama behind this request for submission. 
So after I substituted in my new attorney and my new attorney reached out to my ex, she acted in a really weird way. Um, I remember my attorney telling me that she was not recognizing the fact that I had a new attorney, that she wanted to know what happened to my last attorney. Um, you know, the emails are going to speak for themselves. I remember her wanting to meet my attorney in person somewhere, maybe a coffee shop or a restaurant, um, insisting on meeting with her before letting the proposed order go through. Um, again, let's just take a look at the emails. We can talk about it that way. So uh, this is a pretty uh, lengthy request for submission with citations to multiple exhibits. And it's just supposed to submit the matter to the court for consideration. And what it's submitting I believe is a proposed order, if I remember correctly. This attorney took over the completion of the proposed order. Um, and it has to do with objections and my ex not wanting to agree to the entry of the proposed order. So we've got Rule 5 Certificate of Service. We've seen several of these before, just indicating that this request for submission was mailed to my ex. You know, I suspect that my ex thought she had to agree before that proposed order would be entered. And no, you don't have to agree. But I can imagine my ex thinking that you would have to agree. And since she wouldn't agree, then the order would never be entered, something along those lines. But um, it, it's really hard to figure out what exactly she is thinking Sometimes. Other times, well, I know it is difficult to figure out what she's thinking. It's easier to predict what she's going to do than to know what exactly she's thinking. Um, anyway, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven exhibits in this request for submission. Exhibit one is a proposed order, guys. We are going to take a very close look at that final order. Rather than me go through this order that's not been signed yet, I'm going to just glaze through it. And when we get to the actual signed um, and entered order, order we'll go through that in detail this order was not rejected by the court it was accepted so even though my ex refused to agree and you know complained about all these problems with this order the uh, judge just disregarded all of her objections and entered the order anyway signed the order so when we get that signed copy we will spend um all of the time in the world going through it not line by line but paragraph by paragraph so again this is unsigned if you want to know more about proposed orders and how they work Please watch my video on the topic proposed orders. It is a must watch for anyone representing themselves. Um, in fact, even if you have an attorney, it is a very serious uh, topic to go over because you could end up winning your hearing and then the proposed order that you send into the court is inadequate. And then you don't get something that you won in the hearing just because your lawyer or you forgot to make sure that it was in the order. Or sometimes you'll have an opponent's attorney who inserts things into the order that were never actually ordered by the judge. Anyway, um, here is the first email. This is my attorney sending, or no, it's a letter? Maybe she mailed it to her. This is my attorney mailing this letter to my ex. It says, please find the enclosed proposed, proposed order regarding the November 4, 2014 hearing for your review. Review the order carefully for accuracy. Note that pursuant to the local rules, you have just five days plus three days for mailing to review the proposed order. So my attorney is even letting her know she has a very limited amount of time to review this order and that she has to contact the lawyer regarding any issues or changes she'd like to discuss with regards to the proposed order. This is pretty simple stuff in the uh, that I discuss in the video proposed orders. Uh, exhibit three. We have an email here. This is my ex's, oh my gosh, this is her new email. <laughs> she got this email right after the, maybe it wasn't right after. Okay, so guys, as far as I remember, she got this email right after losing custody. I'm not sure, maybe I'm off a little bit, but it was relatively new email that she just puts her name in as Army's mommy. I guess she felt threatened that her identity as his mother was being erased. When in reality, the person that was erasing it was her through her conduct. But in a, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. I just remember this now. Um, this is this. She went from her ordinary email, which was Monica Sunshine, and she switched over to this one. So she says, "Hi, Miss Cavarotti. I'm having trouble with my Yahoo account. Rarely use it. So after struggling with it, I have given up and created a new email account. Hopefully." I won't miss emails now as this new account shouldn't have any spam. Previously, her lawyer did most of the communication and she is confused by the order she received from both her in the email and in the mail. The minutes from the hearing, the order, and your emails all say different things and I was wondering if I could meet with you in person. Uh, that just is so inappropriate. What that, what that's, 
And that's also going to increase the costs of the attorney fees if I had to pay attorney fees, but I don't because she's my friend. Um, she dislikes resolving things in court. She's always had and is hoping now that I have an attorney that things will be resolved out of court more often. Also, she should know that I have sent a lot of emails and texts. She generally does not initiate contact with me because of the way that she feels I threaten her. So, <laughs> okay. So if she is asking to be contacted and not contact me, she would be more than happy, except that she is not... Except that not responding to me could be used against her in court. So perhaps when they meet in person, she can explain why it's okay for me to contact her about court stuff when he has an attorney and how I can go about responding. Okay, so guys, I, I know I've talked about this before. She's playing dumb. She knows how this works. Um, I've explained this before. When you contact your opponent about parent stuff, you contact your opponent directly. When you contact your opponent about legal stuff, so... Um, you know, if you want to say, hey, pursuant to NRCP 16.1, we need to have this meeting, that you have to send to their attorney. Uh, under these circumstances, my ex doesn't have an attorney. She's representing herself. So she's acting in both the capacity of a mother and a lawyer. So she would be getting legal communications as well. Now, I have an attorney, so legal communications should be going through my attorney to her. I highly doubt that I sent her any legal communications. But I'm just letting you guys know that when you have a lawyer you have your lawyer send the legal communications. When you don't have a lawyer, you send those because you are the lawyer and you're, you're acting in the capacity as an attorney. When you don't have an attorney, you have to send both because oh, I just said that. Sorry, what I meant to say is when your opponent has an attorney, same thing, those legal communications should go to their attorney, but parental communications should go directly to them. So she knows how this works. It makes sense. It's logical. I think most people understand this, but she's playing dumb. She's acting like she doesn't know what's going on because that's actually the angle that she wants. This is the position that she wants to take so that she can meet that attorney in person. The conclusion or the objective here is to meet the lawyer in person. So she has to say certain things. She can't act all knowledgeable because if she does, then she'll be able to resolve it over the phone or through email. She has to act like she needs help. She doesn't know what's going on. And in a weird way, she's almost trying to make my lawyer her lawyer too. But um, none of that's going to work. My attorney is going to refuse. I think initially she was open to the idea, but she changed her mind later. I can't remember why she changed her mind. Um... So, dear Ms. Farrar, so my attorney is telling her that her schedule is quite busy. Would you be available to speak by phone around 3 p.m. this afternoon? If not, what is your availability tomorrow morning? Here's Exhibit 5. My ex is communicating back to my attorney, saying I prefer in person as I am a visual person and will understand easier if we can compare paperwork right. I can be free tomorrow and later in the morning if it works better. So she's insisting. She's just based, she's trying to make the rules. She's not respecting the boundaries that my attorney has set forth. And my ex is saying, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do what I said I want to do. Um, again, my ex thinks she's in a lot more control than she really is. She doesn't understand that there are certain things that she just can't do. So if she knew that, she wouldn't try and do this. But she doesn't know that. Um, exhibit six. And this is my ex's Again, emailing, saying, so you do not have time to meet tomorrow? Um, what is this email underneath? I think that a lot of what I have received is inaccurate, and I don't want to end up arguing. And I think if we met in person, we could probably resolve most of my questions, the inaccuracies. Um, she understands that she can't give advice, but she certainly can explain what you mean by something or your perspective on behalf of Mr. Falcone. I know Mr. Falcone met with my lawyer several times. That's not true. I only met with her lawyer one time, um, and it always resulted in things being worked out. Yeah, these working outs happened through email and over the phone. It was never in person. The one in-person meeting that I did have with her attorney, it didn't get worked out. So the phone visitation is right now the biggest concern, although she has others. And you said different things in writing, and I think if we met, we would... no. This is, this is, you know what, you guys can just take your own interpretation of this and put something in the comments. I'm sure many of you are going to have an opinion on this kind of um, communication with my attorney. By the way, guys, if you want to know, I have a video on this topic. It's called communicating with lawyer or with your lawyer, or maybe it's communicating with lawyers or attorney communications. I really wish I could remember the title of these videos um, just off the top of my head. But there is a video that I have covered 
um, that I have done that covers the topic of how to communicate with attorneys. And this is not the proper way to communicate with attorneys. Um, my ex was under the impression that she had to wait to file a response if they don't meet after you filed your proposed order. Um, so yeah, that's basically all that. Exhibit seven. Again, my ex is sending an email. My ex is saying, I understand. Oh no, this is my attorney's communication to my ex. I understand you would like to meet in person. However, given my schedule, I am not sure that I will be available to do so. I would prefer to speak on the phone to expedite the process. We can discuss anything you would like regarding changes to the order and outlining parameters of phone visitation. I would like to remind you that I cannot give you any legal advice. Okay, so it looks like this was the email that triggered the last email. So these were these exhibits, these last two should have probably been uh, flipped. It doesn't matter though, you guys get the gist. My attorney is refusing to meet my ex in person. Going into the aftermath, I filed a number of documents it looks like well maybe it's not a number maybe it's just one two three four documents but they were all free filings so i incurred zero dollars in costs my ex's attorney didn't file no she did she filed one document a general financial disclosure form i said ex's attorney my ex filed one document it was a free filing so she incurred zero dollars in costs i had an attorney the hearing was about six hours but I did have to meet with her prior for about two hours. I'm going to go ahead and lump that in as prep time. I'm going to just call the waiting time negligible as well as I think she prepared and filed the financial disclosure form. Um, but I did increase the amount that I paid her from, I think it was like 350 to 500 to kind of cover some of that to cushion all the extra little things that she was doing. So I think um, under the circumstances, eight hours is a, pre a pretty reasonable amount of time. So eight hours at the rate of $500 an hour is going to come to $4,000 in attorney fees for me. My ex did not have an attorney, so she incurred $0 in attorney fees. As of my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post those down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.